Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 400. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
please remain standing as we unite in the historic confession of our Christian church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Kind Father, we acknowledge today that every gift comes from you. And we pray, O oh God, just like instruments are placed in tune, that you, O oh God, would tune our hearts towards you. Help us, O oh God, to hear once again the message of grace, to hear your whisper of love and the echoes of mercy not only in our own lives, but as we celebrate with those around us. Lord, we pray that you would be with those, O oh God, in our midst, and those, O oh God, with whom we are very close with. Those, O oh God, who are struggling, those, O oh God, who see nothing but doubt and fear, sickness and illness, Pressures, O oh God, to conform to the world around us, to the desires of our heart. And we pray, O oh God, not only for those others, but also, O oh God, where we recognize the tendencies in the places, O oh God, where we have done that ourselves. It's easy, O oh God, to be blinded by that which is around us. And we pray that in this time, in moments like this, today and throughout the week, that you, O oh God, would remind us that we are yours and you are ours. That you have forgiven us and that there's a certain amount of love, of, of, of uh, thoughts and, and facts that we know about you. That you have already completed. That you have forgiven. That you love. That you have given. We pray that these and so many others would filter into our hearts and flow out through our hands and feet and mouth. That we ask, O oh God, that you would surround us and your church and empower us through your Holy Spirit. We'll be careful, O oh God, to give you all honor and glory as we remember that prayer that you taught your disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 386. We'll sing verse 1 and verse 4. Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings. Multiply them so that they may be used in this church to further your kingdom and hasten your return. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.
Would you please remain standing as we read God's Word today from selected passages from the book of Romans? Hear God's Word. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his, the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I welcome you once again to our worship services. We're very glad that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, in just a few moments, uh, I'll ask the children to come forward and you to greet. But before that, I've got to tell you about that red pad at the center aisle. Uh, I think you all know what to do. Please register your name and uh, pass it down, pass it back again. And now I will cue the children to come forward and you to greet one another. someplace and what you want to do is do one thing good for them okay so we're all going to do that in three weeks okay so we've got to get ready you're going to get ready all right well let's you're not you're not going to get ready well, well we got three weeks we can work up to it well, what we'll do is let, let's pray that god will help us and, and god will help us find that one person and then we'll also know exactly what to do okay so bow our heads let's close our eyes oh god we give thanks that uh, you love us and you care for us we give thanks for these that sit with me uh, we give thanks for their life and for their families. We ask your blessings upon them, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would watch over them, that you would keep them safe, uh, that as they grow, they would grow in, in every way possible. At the same time, we want them to grow in you. 
We want the, the, the understanding and the certainty of your love to be a core part of their identity. And then for us, oh God, uh, in the coming weeks, when one of the things we're going to do to help get ready for, for Advent and get ready for Christmas is to do these random acts of kindness. Uh, guide us and direct us, not just these who sit with me, but all these that are in this room, as we seek to do that for a witness in the community of your love and mercy, particularly at this time of the year. For all these things we give thanks and we ask your blessings and we pray it now in the name of Christ. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Always a, a joy to listen. They'll be performing Handel's Messiah coming up on December the 13th, and I hope you have that uh, at least on your calendars or at least uh, in your mind. Uh, it'll be at the 11 o'clock service a.m., and I do want to invite you to that. I want to also say a word uh, about our commitment cards. I want to say thanks to those that are, uh, have already completed those, uh, those that will be doing those in the coming days. want to say a word of thanks for that. Uh, we've tried to expand this uh, this year. Um, we know that we are, uh, what's common to our, our normal commitment card, obviously, is the things that help us plan financially. Um, but we're really after uh, the service component. And so you'll find uh, these commitment cards are, are in great detail to the best of our ability to, to play out all the different ways that people might serve uh, inside the life of St. Paul. And uh, many have asked how to, how to get this back into our hands. And they're... Uh, you can obviously mail them back in. You can place them in the offertory plates. You can go online. Uh, we have um, both of those laid out online at our website, and they'll go directly to the people they need to go to uh, and, and with confidentialities in place. And so uh, if it's easier for you to do those online, do want to uh, make you aware uh, of this way to, to complete that form. Uh, also want to give you this last little bit of announcement, and uh, this really comes... Uh, it, it deals with our church, and it doesn't deal with our church. I, I was at an event Friday night, and it was a event that uh, I've just have thought about all weekend. H- had to deal with Veterans Day, and um, so often I forget so many things with stuff like this. And but the older I I am, the more that I'm in. I know that I'm indebted to people who have served long long before me, and. Uh, my only experience with our country is just living today. And, uh, but so much of it that we have is uh, at the hands of so many who have served, who serve now and who serve in the past. So if in just the, the busyness of our life, we forget that. If you're like me, that happens. I, I want to remind us again to at least for this week, maybe I hope it becomes more than just a, a, a week or, or a day and just the, our, our, the way we operate, that we're mindful of those who serve and what we've received, and it's been a windfall. And so much we've received at the hands. Uh, we've benefited from other people. Um, and so I hope that's a part of your life this week. I really do, at least in your, your ponderings and your contemplation. I hope you'll go one step further and you'll find someone that has served or, 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 or that is serving at this time and express your gratitude, uh, not just for yourself, but on behalf of so many who are indebted to those who serve. Let's pray. Oh God, we, uh, we have a number of things that seem to, uh, to be a part of our life here, uh, even inside this, just this local congregation. And, and that is... Uh, we could expound on so many of those. And at the same time, if we were to lay on top of just our calendar uh, here at, the, at St. Paul, everybody else's calendar, from work to social life to family, uh, it, it, would, it would be overwhelming. And so may, what we pray, God, is, is at this moment that there would be the ability in all of us to stop for a moment and to allow the text, these passages from the book of Romans, to where they describe forgiveness, to allow them to, to, just, to drench our souls, our minds, our hearts. And for these moments that remain, we would find ourselves in connection, in thought, in awe of who you are and what you do. That, that is the story of the gospel. And so we pray that that would come with such a, a force and power that it will continue works of transformation or maybe for one, it would begin that good work that we know that you'll be faithful to bring it to completion.
for that we give thanks and we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Last night, uh, Brooke and I were talking about just holidays in general. And uh, it, it, I'm sitting there, we're, we're watching TV, watching some of the football games, and we're talking about where we're going to put the Christmas tree. And for some wonderful reason, we have already received our Christmas cards. So mark it down. This is the one time only that our Christmas cards will go out early. Uh, most of the time, we're the ones that you receive like December the 23rd. Uh, but they're, they're here. And... Uh, you know, I, I was thinking this morning, you know, we, we just finished one holiday with, with all the events that are tied to fall festivals in the community and, and Halloween and all that comes with that. And, and then, of course, in our house, we've moved already to, to Christmas. And, and I've always, that makes me feel sad for Thanksgiving. It does. Uh, you know, we move from one with all the hoopla from, and then immediately, I mean, you could go to the stores today and it's, I mean, one of the radio stations has been playing Christmas carols now for a month. Uh, and so I've, I've always felt like Thanksgiving, I'm a middle child. Thanksgiving is a middle child, you know? And there's part of me that wants to stand up and defend it, you know? How do you prepare for Thanksgiving? I mean, we've done some work. Whose house we're going to be at this year? Who's going to fry the turkey, who's going to prepare the other, the vegetables, the dressing, what time we're going to eat. And, and normally for us, we try to fit that in between the football games, at least the one we don't want to watch. So if the good game comes on early, we won't eat early, we'll, we'll eat, we just try to fit it in. And so we go through those practical uh, ways to, to prepare for Thanksgiving. But what I want to do today and next Sunday is to get past that aspect of Thanksgiving and to look at something that's, uh, that's deeper, uh, stuff that uh, for us to think about, to wrestle with, that deals with who we are, deals with our faith, uh, maybe uh, it'll, it'll affect us in our spirituality, maybe uh, emotional preparation for Thanksgiving, maybe relational but to not just move from one holiday into the next and, and miss something that can be so vital, uh, so important for who we are. I'm convinced that thanksgiving is deeply woven and connected to forgiveness. So that'll be the topic for the next two Sundays. That uh, the people I know who live a life where gratitude and thanksgiving just exudes from their persona. They are the ones who live fully in forgiveness. They understand it. They live with it. They grant it. In the scriptures, forgiveness is explained, or, or you could take the concept of forgiveness and you can divide it into two cat categories. There, there's one category that has to deal with receiving forgiveness, and then there's another category that has to deal with granting or giving forgiveness. And for today, receiving forgiveness. You would think that would not be an issue for us, but it actually is. How do you, um, how you handle and deal with forgiveness, receiving forgiveness, it, specifically from God, determines how we deal with other people. That's why it's important. They're related. What you do, what you receive from God influences how you treat other people. And, and the truth is, when it comes to forgiveness, at least from God, God has already forgiven us. That's part of what the New Testament describes. That's what we see in the cross. That what we, that's what we see in, in the resurrection. Uh, you can go back and look in the gospel lessons about what is this, how, how the gospel writers describe Jesus, who he is, what he does. Pay attention to what he says in those last moments on the cross. That gives you insight into what God does with this. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God has already forgiven us. 
The struggle, so, is not whether God will forgive. God has. The issue is, why do we struggle to receive it? And so I want to give you some things to think about today for possible reasons why we, even those inside the church, struggle with receiving forgiveness. We have a hard time receiving forgiveness because we, we, what's woven into our, our DNA is that we think nothing is free. I mean, after all, there's no free lunches, right? We're taught that early on. I mean, I teach that to my children. What I want is for them to develop a strong, a good work ethic. I want, I want, to be, I want them to be proud of the product that they produce. With their, with, and it could be cutting grass. It could be cleaning a room. A little now in hopes that when they get older and whatever professions they choose, that what's not in question is what they do when it comes to work. And so part of what we teach them, nobody's going to do it for you. You've got to do it. You've got to earn it. You've got to go and make it. The problem is we jump from work and we, we make that a, a life principle, a theological policy that says, well, there's really nothing for free. And so, uh, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna achieve, if you're gonna, if you're gonna rise up, you've got to go and do it yourself because nobody's gonna do it for you. We, we teach people to, to pay back, to, uh, that you know, if someone gives you something, uh, you gotta pay them back, you gotta do it back, you gotta reciprocate. I've heard people inside the church when we ask them to describe their faith, they'll say, well, I know that God has forgiven me in my whole life. What I want my whole life to be is I want to pay God back for the goodness he's given me. Now, I understand where they're going with that. The idea is that they're, they're, they've received, but part of that is this thought of scales. You know, I, you know, the, the God has given so much, and so my job, my life is, is to re, is to earn and to create, to do things so that the scales get back in this direction. That's how some of you even seen spiritual disciplines. You know what I mean by spiritual disciplines? Praying, reading, worshiping, studying, uh, reflection. How, how do you see those? Some will see them as things that I have to do as a payback to what God has already done. And so you approach your faith life with the idea that this is what I have to do. Why? Because I gotta pay it back. Now we won't say pay it back, but we want, what we want is more good things on our resume than bad things because then we can present our resume to God and say, look God, I'm not really a bad person. What's the message behind that? Ultimately, we struggle with receiving because nothing's for free. There's a whole theology that was developed in the, in the, in the fifth century, 400s around this. It's called penance theology. And the idea was that uh, the purpose behind this was to do good works so that the, the good works would, would hope be a reminder of what we did that was bad or what we did that was sinful or negative in, in hopes that by doing good, we can train ourselves to do good so that we, we wouldn't do bad. And that's pretty good. But we take that and we turn that into, this is the means by which I can pay back or earn my way even with God. And so ultimately, if the image that we have for God is, is more like this cosmic inventory manager. And he has his clipboard and he's checking them off. And some of you haven't been doing some good stuff. You better get busy. That's what we think. Ultimately, we got to earn it. Got to pay it back. Got to show God that we're lovable. 
One of, my, one of my favorite movies is this movie called The Mission. It's got Robert De Niro in it. He's one of my favorite actors, and he's young, and, and he's a conquistador, and, and he uh, is in the slave trade. And after he's earned enough, sold enough people, he has enough money, he's going to take a, a long-term vacation. And, and when he returns from work, he and his brother get into a fight, and he ends up murdering his brother. And the whole first third of the movie is about he's carrying around all of his conquistador armor. And it's about to kill him. It's muddy, it's rainy, kind of like today. And there's this scene where he's climbing this mountain because he's, tr he's trying to find peace. And, and he links up with this, uh, this priest and they're climbing up this giant mountain and he's falling down because carrying hundreds and hundreds of pounds and, and eventually he gets to the top and he's teetering where you don't know if he's gonna make it or whether he's gonna fall back and, and right when it looks like he's gonna fall back, one of the actual natives that he was chasing pulls out this knife and he cuts the rope and away his iron, all that armor goes. And you would think that this is freedom and he's gonna stand up and, and embrace. He's actually angry because someone cut the rope. And for a minute, he thinks about diving back down the mountain to grab the armor. Because after all, he's got to pay it back. And there's some of us that are just like that. I've got to earn my way. I've got to show God. And so we see good works as a means to earn salvation. When what works are really, it should be a natural conclusion of, once the, uh, of a love of God that just flows. That's different. And so the idea that, that, that God has, did you hear the text? While we were yet sinners, he died for us. You have been forgiven. The issue is, can you really, can you receive it? It might not be free for God, but it is for you. This part you can trust in. Another reason why we struggle with this we have a hard time receiving forgiveness because deep down, we do not like to confess or admit, even admit that we're in need. It's a struggle for us. I mean, when's the last time that you really confessed your sins? I mean, we don't even like to talk about that in the church. We feel uncomfortable whenever we just mention the word sin. No, let's talk about something else. When's the last time? Now, we, what we like is the general, you know, when we do the liturgy for confession, I can keep it general. God, forgive me, forgive us. We're all this way, but don't ask me to actually name the issues that I struggle with. That's a little uncomfortable, isn't it, God? I mean, when's the last time? I'll never forget, and unfortunately, this happens more times than I care to admit. I, I, in the mornings when I wake up early, my family's still asleep. It gives me time to go over my day. I plan it out. I like lists, and part of my list is a time of prayer and, and, and scripture reading, devotional reading. And so I'm, I'm, well, I drink my coffee, and, and, and part of my little prayer time is I've got a little system to it. And, and part of it is I, you know, I need to ask for forgiveness. And so I'll say, God, just forgive me, and then I'll keep on going to the next thing. I kid you not. It's like God said, forgive you for what? Which one? When you lost your cool last night with your spouse and your kids, you want me to forgive you for that? Or do you want me to forgive you where you're prideful? And there's something about how you see yourself at times that can be a roadblock to someone else? Is that what you want to be forgiven for? Which one is it, Shane? So we don't like to get that personal with God. It becomes too much of a struggle for us. Sure, I might be able to ask for forgiveness, generally speaking, but don't ask me to lay my cards out on a table. That requires too much vulnerability. 
You want to know the crazy thing? He already knows. <laughs> so maybe confession is not something that God needs because he already knows it. Maybe confession is something we need. The idea of being transparent enough with God to lay all of our cards out in front of him, as fearful as that may be, but to know even with that, his love does not change. So we're the ones that need confession because confession becomes a means for freedom, liberation. The idea of being set free. That's why we need confession. Not, God doesn't need it. We need it. So that we can be that authentic, that transparent with God. We're not talking about confessing to someone else, another person. We're not talk, I'm talking about receiving forgiveness from God and why we struggle with that. Sooner or later, it will, it, it will involve confession so that it can make its way deep down into the depths of your soul where you know, where you know that God fully knows who you are and yet still loves and cares deeply. That's what forgiveness is. It's, the, uh, it's all the baggage in the armor that you, that we, that all of us carry around and we are destroying ourselves with it. it. Forgiveness is taking out the knife and then cutting it free. That's what it is. And it involves confession, not for God, but for you but for me. But now there are some. The struggle is I, I, I really don't like to admit I need help. St. Augustine's one of my theological heroes. Fourth century bishop of northern Af Africa. Uh, he's the father of Western theology. So he, his theology influenced Luther's, influenced Calvin, influenced Wesley. And so all these that came centuries after him owe a debt to St. Augustine. When he was on his deathbed, he had his closest friends write all the confessional psalms, about eight or nine of them in the Old Testament on the ceiling. And part of his life was to read through those confessional hymns, psalms, scripture. That's interesting. Here, by all accounts on church history, a hero, and yet he needed confessional psalms. I wonder if there's a lesson learned in that. And then finally, we have a hard time with receiving forgiveness, even receive forgiveness from God. And this is where I think most people are because deep down, we're afraid God is really like us. Anthropomorphism. We are this way so then therefore, God must be that way as well. So what do we mean by that? Well, there are times where people, humans, us, hold grudges, can't forgive, angry towards, vindictive, short, small, and we think because that is the life we live sometimes, 
then God must live it as well and see us that way. And so the idea that we have to either work for it or we can't confess, it's really a trust issue because we're fearful God might be like us. I remember uh, Brooke and I were serving in a different church and we lived in a different city and and we struck up a relationship with one of our neighbors and and I remember our neighbor coming over one time and and after we got to know each other, began to talk about uh, some of the struggles that they had Uh, after they gave birth to, to, to one of their children and they associated where they were at because they must have done something wrong and God was punishing them. It's real. Is that true? That someone can feel depressed as punishment? That sits within our culture. The cross is proof that God does not hold judges, I mean grudges, that he's not vindictive. What you see in the cross is a God who who does forgive, who is already forgiven, who, who does love, who will continue to love. The key for us is can we receive it? There are about seven different words, six, seven different words in the Bible to describe forgiveness. I I love the images. One of the great things I love about Hebrew and Greek language is is the the images that present themselves when you just look at the roots and, and when you study the words. Some of the translations for forgiveness, to send away, to send it away or to cover Christ's resurrection, his blood covers our sins, which means you can't see them. They're gone. My favorite is to let loose. The idea of not being bound anymore by them. To be loose. You know, one of the words for forgiveness has as its root that shows up as the same root word for grace and for joy. That's not by chance. Which means it's also connected to thanksgiving. So over the next few weeks, I'm sure there'll be all types of preparation, hurriedly, mind you. Where to eat, what to eat, when to eat, who to come, when to do it. Maybe even multiple times. I hope it gets beyond the temporal See the connection between who you are. Things like gratitude, things like joy, things like grace. They are tied to forgiveness. I I hope this has been a wasted exercise. I really do. But there's not a single one in here that struggles with receiving forgiveness. I really hope so. I'm afraid it's not. You can trust him to receive what he has already given to you. You are forgiven. Do you know that? You are forgiven. Even those things that you've buried down that nobody in the world knows. And you hate it about yourself. You are forgiven. That that is a causation of the cross and the resurrection. Can you receive it? Can you receive it? Oh God, for all of us in here, for those that are joining through online ministries, for for everyone who who sits inside and outside uh, of the church, 
this is a huge issue for us. And it's binding. It's limiting. Whether it be going back and, and reworking missteps about how we see earning and what's, what real cost is, or whether it be the fear to confess to you, to be transparent, or the, or the misguided conclusions that we draw about who you really are. In all of this, and maybe even for other reasons as well, oh God, we want the courage enough to be open. We want the courage enough to be transparent, to receive. Oh God, to receive what you give. My prayer is that... Um, those things that have held us back for oh so long that we would leave these on the pew or on the floor and when this service is over and there are those who serve this church by coming and cleaning up afterwards that they would also take what is left and dispose of that as well so that we walk out of here a new person person living in freedom, joy, gratitude. This is our humble prayer we pray, and we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as you're able. Our hymn of consecration, our hymn of commitment, hymn number 365, Grace Greater Than All Our Sins. I want to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing this hymn together. Hymn number 365.